Lurking in shadows, quick, cunning, and evasive. The words used to describe the modern rogue provides a very vivid depiction of masters of subterfuge, deceit, and stealth, but it wasn't always like that. In fact, it would be fair to say that the early rogue, or rather the thief as it was originally known, was probably the worst class in Dungeons and & Dragons, and it would take quite some time in a few editions until it would develop the prowess that it has today. No trace of the rogue, or the thief for that matter, can be found in the original printing of Dungeons & Dragons. It would take until its first supplement, Greyhawk, that we would see the inception of this iconic class, which would then be known as the thief. It should be noted that the earliest version of the thief was actually a fan submission released in Dragon Magazine some months before the release of Greyhawk. The version that would be officially published by Gary Gygax in the supplement was supposed to be an updated and balanced version of the class, allegedly. Through the description of the class alone, you might be forgiven for confusing the thief with that of the 5e rogue. As per the Greyhawk text, the thief is described as being able to open locks, remove small traps, listen for noise, move with great stealth, pick pockets, hide in shadows, strike silently from behind, and climb nearly sheer surfaces. However, it's in the execution of these abilities that the thief largely left a lot to be desired. Thieves had a number of other interesting features, including being able to read 80% of languages by 3rd level, being able to use spell scrolls by 10th level, with the caveat of spells of 7th level or higher, having a 10% chance of employing the reverse effect. The thief also had the ability to strike silently from behind, the spiritual predecessor to the modern sneak attack, which would provide a bonus to the hit modifier, as well as double damage of hits every 4 levels. Additionally, the thief had the ability to climb nearly perfectly sheer surfaces, with only a 13% chance of slipping, a chance which decreased by 1% at each level. On the face of it, the thief sounds like an interesting and unique class that can fill in gaps that parties may have been missing until this point. However, as alluded to earlier, it isn't any particular ability of the thief that lets it down, it's just the execution. Thieves were able to use magical daggers and swords, which was particularly useful as they were some of the most powerful items in the game, However, it only has a d4 for its hit dice. Furthermore, they can only use leather armor and cannot use shields at all. Additionally, not having access to spells until 10th level, and then even still requiring the use of a scroll is a huge knock to the class's power level. This bizarre combination of features and limitations renders the thief's usefulness in combat questionable at best. However, it's not just in combat where the thief would struggle. Even its iconic abilities were painfully lackluster in the Greyhawk era. It would take until 7th level until a thief would have even a 50% chance or greater to pick locks or remove traps, something that magic users could do with a 100% success rate at 3rd level through the use of knock. Similarly, it would also take until 7th level until the thief would have a combined chance at moving silently and hiding in shadows that was also over 50%. Stealth in early D&D was not the single role that it is today, but rather it was a combination of two checks, move silently and hide in shadows. This dramatically increases the chance of failure for anyone, but is especially punishing for a thief, as they couldn't even reliably execute a core class feature until 10th level, at which point they still only have at least a 75% chance of succeeding at hiding in shadows. And as if all that wasn't enough to add insult to injury, none of these attempts could be made twice. With Advanced Dungeons & Dragons came the first attempt at modifying and improving the class in an effort to make it at least… usable. And to a large degree, they were successful. However, the Thief was still left with a number of glaring issues. Their lack of combat prowess has not really been addressed, in fact they are described as fighting only slightly more effectively than magic users, which is not exactly confidence inspiring. Mechanically speaking, a number of improvements were actually made to the Thief during this period. Their hit dice was increased to a d6, they can now successfully pick pockets 50% of the time by 5th level, and reading spells through scrolls no longer caps out at 7th level spells. However, now all spells have at least a 25% chance of reversing the effect. Sadly though, this is where the improvements end. Most of the other iconic abilities still require the Thief to be at least 7th level, and only provides a 50% or greater chance of success, though Hide in Shadows requires 9th level for the same chance of success. The ability to read languages that once granted the chance to read 80% of languages at 3rd level, now only begins at 4th level and is limited to 20%, capping at 80% all the way at 17th level. AD&D also introduced subclasses to the game. The Thief received the Assassin subclass, which mostly suffers the same fatal flaw as the base class. It has the ability to don disguises, poison weapons, and potentially instantly kill foes, but these are largely narrative elements and overall, the subclass is sadly not nearly as interesting as it could be. 
Second edition would bring significant changes to the class, which is now called the Rogue for the first time. Although, the Thief still lives on as one of the subclasses for the Rogue, alongside the Bard. Rogues are still described in much the same way as they were previously. People who feel the world owes them and put in minimal effort for maximum reward. Their available weapon pool has expanded slightly, though it is still restricted, as has their pool of available armor. Thieves can wear leather, studded leather, padded leather, or elven chain. Though it bears mentioning that if they wear anything other than leather, it will result in penalties to their various abilities. Rogues in 2nd edition still maintain many of the same abilities that you would expect, but this time there was a lot more customizability afforded to them. All thieves would start with access to the same 8 abilities. Pickpockets, open locks, find or remove traps, move silently, hide in shadows, detect noise, climb walls, and read languages. Each of these abilities would have a base score assigned to it, ranging from 0% all the way up to 60%. At first level, a player can assign 60 percentage points as they see fit with two exceptions. They cannot assign more than 30 points to one skill, and no one skill can go above 95% including any other modifiers. So what exactly were those modifiers? Each ability gets a plus or minus for various reasons based on your race, dexterity, or the armor you are wearing. A player would need to reference these tables during character creation and during a level up, or if they were to change their armor to see how their abilities would be impacted. For example, an elven thief wearing elven chain with 12 dexterity would actually end up with a 0% chance to pick pockets, so they would need to add some of their discretionary points into this ability if they wanted to be able to use it at all. While I won't go into the nuance of every ability, some worthy of note are opening locks and disarming traps which, if failed, cannot be tried again until the character levels up, as these locks or traps are considered to be outside of their skill level. The concept that we know of as stealth is still two separate roles, hide in shadows, and move silently. Interestingly though, here the DM rolls the percentile dice and does not tell the player the score. As a result, the rogue player always thinks that they are hidden, but does not actually know if they are. Backstab, the predecessor to sneak attack, is also still present. It provides a plus 4 to hit and damage multipliers up to 5 times. However, it requires a target to not hear or see or anticipate the attack in any way. The creature must also be humanoid and the rogue must be physically able to reach the target's back. Overall, 2nd edition made some significant improvements that really helped the rogue obtain its own identity, be much more customizable, and was a much more useful member of the party. While I am examining the rogue from 3.5, I will say 3rd edition interchangeably throughout this section for simplicity. Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 yet again changed a lot for the rogue. While their hit dice would still remain a d6, this would be the addition that would see the inclusion of many of the class staples that we see today. Sneak Attack, actually being called that, Evasion, and Uncanny Dodge all made their debuts in 3rd edition, despite working a bit differently. Sneak Attack works similarly to its 5e counterpart, though its requirements are a bit different. The damage multipliers from previous editions are gone, and are instead replaced by an incremental increase in damage starting at 1d6 and increasing every 2 levels before maxing out at 10d6 at 19th level. Rogues were able to execute a sneak attack whenever a target is denied their dexterity bonus to AC, a situation that could occur for a variety of reasons including being caught flat-footed, a condition that applied if you were trying to balance or before your first turn in the initiative order. Additionally, a rogue could sneak attack if the target is flanked, similar to in 5e. Many of the same restrictions that applied to sneak attack in previous editions are also carried forward, including the requirement for the target to be living with discernible anatomies, and the target must be able to be seen well enough for the rogue to be able to pick out the vulnerable spot. Evasion is very similar to its modern version, except it was split into two, evasion and improved evasion. The former preventing all damage on a successful reflex save, while the latter still granting that same bonus, but also reducing damage by half on a failed save. This feature could also only be used if the rogue is wearing no or light armor. Uncanny Dodge was also split into two, and its function was very different than the modern version. Uncanny Dodge would allow a rogue to retain their dexterity bonus to AC if they were being caught flat-footed, or if they were hit by an invisible attacker. The improved version would make it so that rogues would suffer no penalty if being flanked. The rogue has a number of other special abilities that can be chosen every third level starting from 10th including some other ones that have been carried forward, such as Slippery Mind. Lastly, the skill selection is broadly similar to the version implemented in 2nd edition, although the percentile dice are now gone. Instead, players can allocate points to certain skills based on their intelligence modifiers at each level, including first. A dynamic and improved and more streamlined system than its predecessor that allows for greater flexibility without the negative modifiers.
Much like I mentioned in my wizard video, 4th edition is such a dramatic departure from everything that came before it, 4e classes probably deserve a video of their own. I'll just mention a few key things here, as it would take far too long to actually go into everything. Classes in 4th edition had at will, daily, encounter, and utility exploits that determine when they can use their individual features. There is something like 30 levels now, and sneak attack is still present though, once again, it has a slightly different function. Notably, it makes no mention of requiring the target to be humanoid. Though this could also be some quirk of 4th edition, I'm not all that familiar with it. Probably most interestingly, we see the inclusion of the at will exploit, Sly Flourish, which most people will know as a D&D channel. 4th edition also includes the hide in plain sight feature, which would later be attributed to the ranger in 5th edition, and would be the butt of many jokes. 4th edition also had a number of paragon paths, which are sort of like subclasses that you could pick at certain levels to help distinguish your character a little bit more. Much like everything else in 5th edition, the Rogue class has also become much more streamlined and simple to use. Its hit dice is now a d8, stealth is now one single roll combined for the first time, sneak attack functions differently again, this time largely leveraging the advantage and disadvantage mechanic introduced in 5th edition while also retaining the previous flanking option, though the damage still scales from 1d6 at 1st level to 10d6 at 19th. Though many of the customization options first introduced in 2nd edition have been removed in a sense, the Rogue still retains many of the same advantages that it had in previous editions. It's worth noting that it does have 6 opportunities for ability score improvements or feats, compared to the normal 5 of most other classes. What I find most interesting is that in a lot of ways, the 5th edition Rogue actually resembles the version found in Greyhawk the most. Except that it's just a lot better. Whereas previous editions would have explicit statements saying that only a rogue could even attempt a certain thing, in 5th edition, pretty much anyone can at least attempt many of the things that would typically be attributed to a rogue, such as picking locks or pockets, detecting traps, and stealth. The difference is that while anyone can do those things, the rogue is usually better at them, or at the very least, has better alternatives to deal with the problems that might occur. Features like reliable talent make a rogue much more consistent across the skill checks that they are proficient in. Evasion makes dealing with certain trap damage much more manageable. Cutting action allows a rogue to dodge, disengage, or hide as a bonus action, which makes escape from certain situations much more reliable. As mentioned earlier, while the customization in the form of skill points or percentage points into typically roguey abilities have been removed, they are now offered many of the same things as a result of the plethora of subclass options available to them. Rogues currently have a choice of 9 subclasses to pick from at the time of writing. They can be anything from swashbuckling pirates to an undead phantom to a sketchy thief which has finally made its return. So while customization options look very different than in previous editions, it has also become much more accessible as it is simply built into class progression and is in much more automated form, which was certainly one of the goals of 5th edition. The Rogue went from being objectively the worst class in D&D's history to one of the most iconic and fun. I find the parallels between the Greyhawk Rogue and the 5e variant to be quite telling of how they were certainly onto something at the time, it just wasn't executed very well. The Rogue is unquestionably one of my favorite classes, and while it has had so many iterations across the decades, I'm sure that it will continue to live on as the game grows and changes. If you enjoyed this video, consider checking out my History of the Wizard class, it's linked on screen right now, or some of my other content. But otherwise, take care.